Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us here for another episode. Wherever in the world you are listening to us from, whatever platform you're listening to us on, as I say every episode, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you guys for the support, the kind messages, the emails, the questions. Keep all those coming. Really appreciate hearing from you guys. Today, we're going to talk about some positionless basketball. And as I mentioned before I started recording, I feel like, at least not my area, that's kind of the way the game is. And I think that in general, the game is kind of headed in that direction where players are expected to kind of be on all places on the court, be able to kind of have a skill set where they can be placed in anywhere and be effective. And I think that it just really opens up the game and opens up our players' potential to have them on, on all different spots on the floor. So we're going to talk about some positionless basketball today, some implementation of that, uh, the way the offense is run and, and player identity and all, and all the good stuff that comes with running that kind of a positionless basketball system. So, of course, I do not do this alone. I'm very happy to be joined by uh, quite a busy individual, not only uh, an athletic director, uh, a trainer, a uh, very busy individual. He's also, of course, a basketball coach at Mingo Valley Christian. Very happy to be joined by Coach Will Bryson today. Coach, thanks for carving out a little bit of time to talk to me today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm excited to be here and share some of my knowledge. And, uh, you know, as, as as basketball junkies like to be, we just like to talk about the game uh, no matter where it is and how we do it. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. Coach, let's start with uh, your basketball journey and your coaching journey. What, where's your journey taken you and, and what got you to Mingo Valley? Um, sure, man. It's, it's a, it's a pretty long and windy one. Um, uh, <laughs> But um, but I I went to high school in um, in in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, kind of jumped around like I before the transfer portal was pretty popular. I mean, a lot of kids did transfer schools, so I went to a public school for a little bit, but finished at Destiny Christian School in in um in uh, Dell City, Oklahoma, which is a suburb of uh, of Oklahoma City. Um, went on from there and played uh. Well, signed a scholarship to play at Langston University, which is a um, predominantly um, black college here in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and then transferred to Oklahoma Christian University, where I spent some time there. But after, you know, uh, some family um, situation that came up, mm -hmm. uh, decided to step away from school and then went back, uh, kind of helped out with the program over there at, at uh, kind of in a manager type position or support role. Um, but from there, I, I spent a summer, uh, did some basketball camps at the University of Oklahoma, which is a dream school of mine. And so ended up transferring there and finished my undergrad, um, spent some time with the manager uh, up under Lon Kruger um, there. Okay. Um, and then spent some time away from that. Um, after I graduated my undergrad, went and worked the DHS, uh, Department of Human Services, uh, as a caseworker. And uh, did some work in counseling because that's what my uh, undergrad was in. And then um, did some part time coaching with football and basketball at Westmore High School. Um, and then I got the call again from Coach Kruger to come out, and he had a GA position open. So came and did that and got to be around some more, which I was at the start of Buddy Hill's career, but got to watch oh, okay. him finish it uh, there in 20. 15 to 2017. Um, then um, we, I think it was pretty much like the week after we um, uh, signed Trey Young uh, to to the University of Oklahoma. I, re I I was received. I received an offer to take the job here at Mingo Valley Christian, which at the time was very small, which is mm -hmm. still very small. We got about 350 kids uh, K through 12, but at that time it was like 279 kids. Wow. Uh, K through 12 with no basketball acumen at all uh, or anything, very little talent. They they kind of more so treated 
sports as kind of, I mean, it's extracurricular, but kind of treated it more like rec. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. coming in, it was, it was pretty much like coaching the game to the bottom of the barrel to high school kids. So um, I wanted to take that on and I didn't want to really necessarily get stuck in a, you know, in, in, in college circles, you either, you know, you're either a court person or you're a desk person. So um, uh, I didn't want to be necessarily a desk person, meaning a, a video coordinator, which, I mean, there's a lot of video coordinators that have developed into, you know, great coaches. But a lot of times mm-hmm. if you're a dobo or a video coordinator, you're probably going to be linked to those jobs for forever. Um, so um, I wanted to kind of get into the coaching. And so when I felt like my niches in high school with my counseling, background and dealing with kids already when I worked for DHS. So now I'm here. So um been here for seven years and well six years, just finishing my sixth year and we've had some pretty good success and just about to finish my first year as an athletic director. So it's been a blessing for me to be here and and learn and be able to grow as a coach, but also uh just as a person, um kind of being organized and or learning how to be organized. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we never really have that always under control, but um, that's kind of where I'm at. And and that's kind of a little bit of my journey that led me to where I'm at now. I'm really curious because I don't think I've, I've, I've asked this question of anyone before and this kind of sprung in my head thinking about, about your background. Uh, when you took over as athletic director, did that did you kind of see things a little bit differently? What was kind of like, what did, did your eyes open up to kind of the way things were in terms of like athletics or seeing, you know, athletics from the lens of an athletic director that maybe you wouldn't have seen as a coach? Like what did becoming an athletic, athletic director kind of like open your eyes to a little bit that maybe those coaching don't necessarily know about because they're not in that chair? Yeah. I mean, as, as a basketball coach, you can just focus on basketball, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. And that's something I've had to kind of transition a little bit more from this year because, I mean, basketball, I eat, breathe, and sleep it all day long. You know, like, I mean, the NBA playoffs are going right now. So, like, as soon as I get out this interview, like, I'm going home to watch them, uh, spend a little bit of time with my son before we we put him to bed, but also, you know, watch a little b-ball and watch some NBA playoffs and and enjoy that, you know. Um, sure. But from a from an athletic director standpoint, you got to focus on every sport, you know, like it just can't be basketball. Obviously, like I would love, like I would favor, you know, as a basketball coach, I favor basketball. But, you know, if you favor basketball, like people are going to quickly pick up on that. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of get to give everybody some love. And so like one thing that you don't see is the, all the juggling and the the schedule that you that that you got to put together, the the fundraising the meetings, the, the all that. It's, it's like you got to come and you're pretty much making a decision almost all day long. At least uh, if you have like a 10 hour work day, you're probably making this 10 decisions that day, you know, of, of mm-hmm. what can happen, which I'm not a part of a large, you know, uh, athletic department, but there's a lot of decisions that come across my table that I, I have to focus on. And so, um, there's a lot of hats that you got to wear. And so, um, you know, so, so it, it's a, it's a little bit different than just being a coach. Cause you got to make a lot of decisions being a coach too. Mm-hmm. Um, but also there's just a lot of hats that you just got to wear, um, you know, and, 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 and it's kind of made me a little bit more aware of where I'm spending my time at and, and, and being able to be there for all of my coaches and all of my athletes, whether they play basketball or not. Yeah, you really got to get that schedule uh, mapped out to a T. And re- I, f- I feel like a job like that really uh, get- gets you to be efficient and use your time as best as possible. Oh, I could use some help in that still. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process, right? It's a journey. Very, very okay. much. Uh, you mentioned about how you're, you're at a small school with limited resources. And I know, you know, when, when you're at a school with limited resources or at a smaller school, it's really easy you know, to, to make excuses or to fall into a rut or, or just kind of, for lack of a better term, sort, sort of give up and kind of accept your fate. But but obviously, I know that that's not how you are as a coach. So I want to want you to talk a little bit about some of the maybe some of the challenges that you faced, but then also how did you work to kind of overcome them and, and, and still put out a successful program, even if you had some some challenges and some limitations? Um, Like, I mean, I, I listened to your last uh, podcast kind of preparing for this one, like what uh, Coach Derek Scott, um, oh, yeah. he was talking about in Chicago, how they don't have, you know, their own home gyms 
like we we're fortunate that we do have a gym that we use for all of our home games. Um, that's that's I mean that's a, it was a, it's a college, but they formerly had a basketball team, so we got a good relationship with them. So we got a place where we get to play all of our home games at, mm-hmm. but like you know practices, like that's not always a guarantee uh, because we rent out gyms, and I gotta like I mean. I think this last year I spent over 10, 10 grand just in basketball practices, so basketball practice space for all of our teams, you know, K, uh, I mean, first grade to to high school for us to practice in. So um, that that's a little bit of a hurdle, which if we, if we even if we build a gym on campus, we're probably still going to run into that um, situation because, you know, um, if you don't have three or four gyms on your campus, like, you're, you're kind of at the whim of other people in their schedule. So, um, and then you also got this thing called volleyball that, that takes up a lot of time <laughs> as well. So, um, yeah. so a, as we're working through some of these, you know, things like not having a gym, we have limited facilities. Um, yeah, like we don't have an athletic trainer. So like we got to find ways to, all of our coaches got to be versed in, in, in athletic tape and, you know, wrapping ankles and, and doing procedures if someone falls out or passes out or anything of that nature. So there's a lot of things from an athletic standpoint, athletic director standpoint that I have to cover that other schools probably don't, you know. And so, like, you know, we're, we're surrounded by a couple of 6A schools and they have all of that at their whim, you know. The athletic director sure. shows up, makes sure everything runs smoothly. Where you got athletic uh, trainers, they're there, you know, making sure everybody's healthy. You got your coaches, they don't have to worry about it. As me, I got to worry about it. If I'm coaching, I got to worry about, is this kid going to pass out? Do I got everybody in place? Like, So yeah, yeah, no, a lot more sure. than just game strategy that that comes with that, you know, so. Um, well, but, but I, it, it's kind of like the, you know, it's, it's I can kind of tell from from your response. It's just like, it, you just got, you just got to do it sort of thing. Like, yeah. it, it just is what it is. Like, either, either, like, it's it doesn't get done if nobody does it. And so if you are going to take on that, that that challenge and be at that school, like, that just is what it is. And, hey, I mean, it gets you an uh, opportunity to maybe learn some new things that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. And and one of my biggest models is, um, like, I tell all my kids, I don't want no excuses. Like, mm-hmm. I, I run by no excuse policy. I tell it to my parents. I tell it to my students. I tell it to myself, like if we're, we're making excuses, like then I mean we already lost the we already lost the battle. So uh, and that's the kind of attitude I have with my school. Like we're gonna show up, whatever sport we're playing, like we gonna we gonna like we'll 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 compete and we'll give it your all. And like when we leave the gym, you're gonna be like, man, like that team ain't got no 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 gym, no dude, like they they have everything. Less than what we got. I want them to know, like when I leave, like yeah, yeah, you 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 played me, you played us, mm-hmm. like we 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 we're coming after everything that you got. And if you if we get those resources, then you're gonna be in trouble. You know, yeah. so we're doing it with, without lack. So it's kind of just my attitude and the attitude that I bring. It's kind of like that that big time underdog uh, mentality. Like uh, you know, I tell all my kids, I like, win, lose, a draw. Like I just want you to go out there and show up and play hard. That's all I want. And so that's the model that we have, and and that's the model we like. We just don't no excuses uh, for me and, and my kids. So if we lose, you just beat us. If we win, we'll win with graciousness and gratitude, and and we'll we'll we'll, we'll pray for you and 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 call you and you know and 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 do things for that's right in our community. So we'll um, but we we just kind of have that attitude to just go out there and just compete as hard as we can. Uh, no, I I love that. I love I love that attitude of like no no matter what happens at the end at the end of the game that other team's gonna know like oh like like we had we we had to give it our all or that that team gave everything that they had against us win lose or draw and it's always nice I think to know as a coach that you really feel that you like got the most out of your guys or your girls that you possibly can I think that's one of the best feelings in coaching to really feel like you you did like pretty much everything you possibly could yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and even then, like I tell, like I mean, I, I would, I would say, for example, like this year, from beginning of the season, you know, and obviously, like we're not a part of state association, so we can practice a little bit more than most. But like I try to follow all state association rules. Uh, we only get about forty-eight. Like we we practice forty-nine times this year. Okay. Like the wow. the average probably of the school around us is probably sixty-five to seventy. So we're we're missing Make the most out of your time. Yeah. 
because like we don't practice on Wednesdays most of the time because you know private Christian school like like a lot of people go to church on Wednesdays and things of that nature. Okay. Um, and then a lot of people have shoot arounds and stuff on Sunday. It's like I don't, I'm not practicing on Sunday. I like to spend time with my kids. Like <laughs> so like. I, I I also think because of that, or my kids are a lot fresher too. Now, now, do we have open gyms and stuff like that? Yeah, um, to to be able to try to get in the gyms and and get some shots up. But other times than that, like I like for my kids to have a life a little bit too. So, um, so like, I think that's what makes our program a little bit unique in that I'm, I'm not killing our kids because I also like we're very taxing in the classroom and stuff like that so i take a lot of our as academics seriously because i can sure. probably do more so to sell you as a student athlete than if you're just an athlete especially at the level that some of our kids are going to be playing which is nei maybe some d2 and some d3 where those full ride scholarships aren't given out to just everybody you know yeah so, they gotta separate themselves in some way right and do yeah. stuff in the classroom and be involved in other activities and things like that yeah yeah so yeah so, yeah, we just try to build up the whole student as, as best we can. Love it. Coach, yep. talk to me about the process of uh, going, going positionless of basketball. Uh, what, what was that process like, and why was that something you thought that your team needed? Um, we, 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 I mean, in the state of Oklahoma, there's not a ton of size. I mean, I can go a whole year without seeing somebody over 6'4". Um, you know, like some of our bigger schools got some got some hype, but like you know, you know, in in classes, which I don't know how how you got to do it in your your, but you're like you got class A, I mean class B, class A, three A, uh, one A, two A. Yeah, I mean, we got the one A to six A. Yeah, yeah. So so you know, you get from class B to three A, you probably maybe in the in the whole in however many schools that is, maybe over 150 schools, you may have. 10 or 12 kids that are, you know, six, three to six, seven, six, eight, like, and so it's not a lot. So when we do come in against those teams, yeah, like we're a little bit of, of a disadvantage because we may get out rebounded or something like that. But um, the reason why I went to that is just like, we don't have a lot of big players. Like I had one post kid last year, which he's been a post, but he's six, two, but he got really good footwork, so he actually does really well against you know kids that are bigger than bigger and taller and stronger than him because he got excellent footwork. Mm -hmm. But like for the most part, all of our kids are guards, and I train them as guards because um, like I, I I have a couple of kids that are freshmen that they always like, hey, let's do post work. I'm like, you probably don't need to do post work. You're six foot one. Like, let's try to work on your on your on your ball handling. I mean, yeah, you might play a five spot where you where you, where you don't touch the ball as much like we run a lot of zoom actions um where you could be at a point of contact for the zoom where you kind of do a dribble handoff or a pitch to catch it and into a ball screen we'll probably do something like that but you at least need to be comfortable handling the rock up top so uh that process for us kind of starts in the summer um which you know here in a couple of weeks which when school ends we start summer workouts and you know, pride, and then you got team camps and things of that nature. Um, but that 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 um that process kind of starts going there and kind of figuring out where kids will be most effective. Is this kid more effective shooting three from the uh, corner or from the wing? Is this kid more effective at ball screen and maybe dribbling into a post up and going to score? Is this kid good in ISO work? And so, kind of identifying those, and then you know, putting our setting up our offense so each kid can can do what their strong suit is. So, um, but that process is going to start for me here in about, you know, probably a couple weeks um, as I wind down, you know, school as a athletic director. Um, and then I'll be kind of, I can shift a little bit more into basketball mode um, and be able to identify how to uh, put our kids in the right positions. So is that the process that you went went through with this group that you had last year? Did you do a lot of work with the summer over the summer with them, and and did you kind of use that to kind of figure out where they were going to be within your offense? Um, actually, we we literally we I've been a, I've been married to Dribble Drive for a while, which I know Dribble Drive, Dribble Drive can be mo um um can be positionless. Yeah, we kind of ran it with a four out one in, um, and we got some good dividends out of that. We we. We kind of ran a lot of stagger screens through the DDM 
and you know some some staggers into some punch actions, which is you know posting up the the big. But the, our big at, at some point in time, which we didn't really have a lot of strong drivers at that time, was kind of clogging up the paint. And so he's good enough to be able to run a lot of those zoom actions through. So we pretty much went zoom and did a lot of five out in transition, like, you know, drag screens and curls and all that kind of stuff, and really kind of took off with it at Christmas break. And so our scoring went down a little bit, but we were a lot more efficient. So like with our dribble drive, drive, we were shooting at somewhere about 36% because we were in dribble drive, you know, it's a lot more free like flowing. Yeah, yeah, of course. You're, you're shooting the ball a lot more. You're taking more attempts, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so when we went to five out, it kind of slowed the pace down a little bit. We were still playing fast, but, like, it wasn't out of control. And we weren't just taking any and every shot that we saw. So when we went to position list, a lot of the kids, they didn't have to – if you weren't a driver, if you weren't a ball handler, you didn't necessarily have to worry about ball handling. You know, if you were a shooter – you got to your place and you shot, you know, and so it, it kind of simplified the game a little bit more. So second half of the season, we shot about 45 percent from the floor and about 32 percent from three average. Like we were averaging 60 points a game, but we were a very efficient 56 and our defense went up because our possessions weren't so wild. And so teams weren't getting so many transition opportunities. So. Just a little, just that little caveat, like that's kind of whenever we went to that, I, I just felt like we were better suited for a little bit more positionless kind of control type offense than just a crazy, you know, dribble drive and putting people <laughs> in situations where they weren't as effective, you know, so. Um, but there's know. a lot of there's a so in that transition though, um, and this is this is the thing I think that you know maybe some coaches are are, are worried about or, or or they they wonder about is that that position list does give um, a certain amount of I don't know if necessarily freedom is, but players have to be able to go on on anywhere on the court. They they have to in, in theory have to have the ability to kind of be anywhere on the court and and have a little uh, at least a little bit of a skill set in all sorts of areas. So. Yeah. What my question is to you is, I guess, how do you kind of design or work work in a system, work that system in and, and kind of get your guys to where they can kind of like do a little bit of everything, but then it also at the same time, maybe be really good at one thing. Like, was, was that, was that easy? Do you kind of like work on everything with your guys or, do, or is there any like specialization that goes on or how does that kind of work uh, with, with getting your guys in kind of the right spots, even in a positionless system? We we really uh, try to teach everybody in the whole. The only the only person that I really was focused on being a little bit more efficient down around the basket because he wasn't really necessarily shooting with our big kid last year. Uh, so if we did breakout drills in practice, like everybody would doing, we we we'll do ball handling one day, ball handling the shooting. We'll do dribble, you know, hand off DHOs into into jump shots or you know small sided games with two on two, three v three with all of those guys. So like everybody was, you know, the, 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 the dribble handoff person, everybody was a ball screener. Everybody was the dribble driver into a driving kick or, you know, into kicking out for a three. So everybody doing those small sided games, two V two, three, three, four V four. And we mix those in doing defense. So like we mm -hmm. give points for a shell drill instead of just doing Man, like mainly shell, we ran our our actions on offense, and defense get a stop. They got points. If offense scored, they had regular points. So, um, and even my big guy, I had him all over the floor too in practice because hey, what about if someone fouls out? Hey, we we might have to put you there, you know. So I don't like limiting kids to just one spot because who knows? Like that six foot. Kid, if you had an eighth grade, if you just told, told, taught him how to be a post up kid and he ends up not being, I mean, still being six foot, six one, six two, when he gets in high school, like that kid can be a triple threat to, to you. He could post up and he can play a good guard. So uh, I, I don't really like when coaches kind of pigeonhole a kid in there. And I think it, teaching positionless basketball, which is exactly where the game is going will help you get a lot even out of your big kids if you could teach them how to at least be comfortable with the ball. 
Yeah, and 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 you bring up a point uh, that I think a lot of coaches are nervous about, right? You get that 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 kid, even he comes in as a freshman, he's you know six four, six five, and then well, he doesn't grow any further, and you just taught him post moves, and now it's like this guy's got to be a guard, and if you invested all this time in him as a post player, like you're going to be in a bit of trouble. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I I totally get that. So you kind of you kind of work on a, a bit a, a little bit of everything, but. In the, in the course of an uh, in, in an offense now, so so when you get into a game situation, what is that? How does that kind of translate into what it is that that you're running on offense? So when the game starts, how do players kind of know where it is that they're going to be needed to be in in a game situation? Um, we really don't. Um, you know, we get we got rim runners, so like in transition, we have somebody that's always running. Like, if you're not getting a rebound, we always got somebody taking them down the floor mm. and we got two wings. But that could be anybody. Like, if you're, if you're, if you're guarding somebody on the wing, guess what? You run a wing. Like, we're not, we're not, you're not crashing. Like, we have numbers of how many people crash at the board. And it kind of depends on the game. So, say if it's somebody that's heavy in transition um, or really good at crashing the glass, then we'll probably crash, crash, crash the glass, you know, just as hard. But if it's somebody that gets back in transition or tries to get back in transition, we'll probably send maybe two to the to to go get a rebound and sprint everybody out. But it's not like if you, if you're in those positions, I'm telling you like go. Like if you get the ball, like unless you're probably my center from last year, but even this year, like we don't really have a true center. Everybody can handle the ball. You get the ball and we're kicking it up the court. Like <laughs> like I don't I don't I I don't want my kids to have to think so much. So this is big on the transition first, then. This is, this is a big like get out and transition and go. Yes. Yes. And so I'm and and then I mean there's stuff that we do in the half court, obviously. You know, like I mean, like I've talked about zooms. We run a lot of zoom. We run a lot of pick and roll, pick and pop. Uh we run a lot of dribble handoffs. Um uh we run a lot of stagger screens, uh off ball. Um so there's stuff that we run in 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 the half court. But most of the time, I'm just calling that on a dead ball or after a timeout. Like I, I want my kids because I think I think especially a lot of kids today, their 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 attention spans are so short. So like if you kind of pivot home, you might not get them. Now you got some coaches that are really 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 good at like teaching it, and then you got some really smart high IQ basketball players. Um, I think you could run a lot of like I mean I watched the NCAA tournament in Princeton. Like I mean the Princeton mm -hmm. like. They, they tweaked it a little bit, but it's still the Princeton offense, you know. And so you got kids that are smart enough to do, do that. But the, the vast majority, especially at a small school like mine that play, like I got three or four kids that play soccer. That's their main sport. But guess what? Soccer and basketball kind of go hand in hand when you talk about spacing and cutting, getting to the open, open spots. So whenever I'm teaching it, I teach it in the whole. Like I, I make a lot of connections to other sports like lacrosse and stuff like that because I watch a lot of that stuff because – I might be implementing some of those sports within our school, but I'm like, hey, like if you just get out and run and you find an open space, like offense is going to be working. You don't have to really think about the, the a play or a play call. I just want you to go out there and hoop and have fun. And then really truthfully, where I put all of my emphasis is on defense. Like if we go get a defense and get stops and get a steal, then we run and get layups. We ain't got to worry about coming down and playing somebody in half corner and have to run all this stuff. So, <laughs> so. So that's where our position list kind of comes from. It's just, you know, our transition and then we flow into whatever we're doing. My my only rule is don't just stop and watch, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking with that, with that, there then has to be a lot of trust that you got to put into your guys that, you know, you're you're not trying to dictate a lot to them or try and, you know, make them run a lot of, a lot of sets necessarily uh, all the time. So is that, something that you've like kind of explained to your guys like hey I'm, I'm putting the trust in you to, to, to kind of make this work and I'm, I'm just kind of curious about how that that trust factor works in because I know sometimes us as coaches we can get we can become real control freaks want to control everything there but it sounds yeah. like in in, in positionless in the way that you're running it you kind of let go a lot and was that was that easy um, how, I, how did that trust process work out it, it, it starts in practice if, if we can success successfully do it in practice and build good habits that it should translate to the game because as a coach practice is our time. Like practice is where like, I, I love practice. I love sitting down and going over a practice plan and figuring out like, all right, like how do we get good? 
you know. Mm-hmm. Game is where the players that that's that's your showcase. You know, like I could go crazy in practice. I can yell, I can scream, I can teach, I can laugh, I can joke and practice. Once once we get to the game, like it's their time to shine. So if you can prove it to me in practice, and you can prove it to me in scrimmages, you can prove it to me in games, then we then we can all be on the same page. But I tell them that I'm like, do you guys want me to to be a thumb on you, or do you want me to let you have a little bit of creative free, freedom and go play? I'm like, how you do that? How I allow you to have creative freedom is you play really good on defense. I know there's not a defensive podcast right now, but if you can give me your all on defense. I'll let you have some freedom on offense because if we're doing our job on defense, then we can get out and run and have fun on offense. And so they, they get married to them and I, and I convince them by playing good defense, we'll be able to do everything that we want to do. So uh, I don't know if that answer your question, but that's how I kind of get them to buy in uh, to the defense side of the ball is to should be able to showcase what they want to do on offense. Well, I, and, and I think, no, that, that does answer it because I think that what really comes down to is like the, the, the work that they do in, in practice and, and, and the trust that is built, like one, like you said, on the defensive end, but also just the way that uh, your, your practices are run. So I'm, I'm assuming that then there has to be a lot of uh, a work done and, and, and your players are going to have to show you a lot during those, those small sided games to really show you that, that, that they know how to make good decision making and, and, and they know kind of what it is that they need to be doing to be effective on the floor that you're, there's probably a lot of, uh, uh, looking at how, how they're acting when you break things down in like a two on two or a three on three, or even maybe in a shell situation. Yeah, I mean, and 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 I tell and I tell them that up front, you know, and and mm-hmm. I think they like it that way. Um, because I mean, I don't know if there's any coaches out there that's listening to this right now that just got a bunch of kids that just play a lot of different sports and they don't really hone in on just one yeah. thing. So, like, I think I believe in making it a little bit easier for them to be able to not have to think about where where exactly am I going? Well, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in transition, all right, if, if I see I get a teammate already in the corner, guess where I'm going to go to? I'm going to run to the wing or the slot position. You know, if 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 I'm bringing the ball down, I got, I got a couple options on the east side to keep the ball a, ahead. If I see an early kick, then – you know, I'm throwing it up there for a layup, and now we're into our press and we're back on defense already before the defense even sets up or know what they're doing, you know. And then, you know, if we're coming out of a timeout, I'll draw up something or we or we have some play calls. Like, I don't really go into a whole bunch of, you know, exotic things, but hey, if we're running Zoom 1, Zoom 2, Zoom 3, guess what? Those are three different calls coming out the same, pretty much the same action. You know, Zoom one may be just, you know, a regular Zoom with two down picks into a dribble handoff and attack off the basket. A Zoom two may just be a kick into a ball screen or a Zoom three may just be a weave action into a ball screen. So it could, I mean, it could just be off the same thing, you know, where I, I make it easy for them to not have to think so much. And I think that's what position of basketball is that most of the time is, it's a thinkless thing, you know. You just get it, go play, and you got a little bit of organization within the chaos. If, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and so, as a as a coach, then when you're kind of in that in game situation, is that is that ever ever difficult for you to kind of have to just kind of watch kind of the mess sometimes unfold and watch them kind of go through it or? Is, is it kind of just part of the process and you've kind of learned to just kind of accept that things are going to be really messy? How do you kind of go about kind of those in-game adjustments and kind of that decision of, you know, let them go and, and let them, you know, go work through it versus needing to actually maybe put in like a little bit of structure, a little bit more like guidance in place of what needs to happen? Um, Early in the season, I'll probably let them go through it a little bit mm-hmm. um, because, I mean, nobody's going to entirely perfect an offense, you know, um, you know, five, six, seven games into the season. Um, more so when we get to playoff time, you know, I, I scout a little bit more once we're in playoff time and stuff like that. So there might be some things that I will do a little bit more to kind of exploit something. Um, but I, I want them to to go through it and experience it. And we'll watch film and be like, hey, this is where we need to work on this. Yeah. All right. At this point in time, 
you know, like that's one thing I learned with 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 Long, with Coach Kruger was his attention to detail whenever he was explaining stuff. Because I, I don't know if you follow, you know, oh, you do. I mean, Austin Reeves was a part of 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 his thing, and and they ran a lot of double ball screens for him and a lot of ball screens, and he made decisions. Mm-hmm. But it was a lot of it was really pretty much held the skelter at at both the time, but he runs he runs a very pro offense heavy system, which I think that's the reason why Austin Reeves is doing so well in the NBA because he ran the same exact stuff in college. So but what what I try to tell them that is like whenever you know we're running these these situations like and we watch it in film, I'll be like, okay, what could you have done here? What could yeah. you have done here? What's the play here? Okay, now I'm looking for them to do it better the next game. <laughs> you know, right? There need to be some improvement going on. <laughs> yeah, and so and that, but and that's also where the freedom lies. All right, like we can I trust you to get better at what we're doing? I I will expect you to look far better than what you did in November when we reach late January, February, getting ready for playoffs. If we're still making the same mistakes that we were doing in November, then we have not made any improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will say this: so, like early in the year, we were averaging about 17 turnovers a game. Now we we're still scoring 60 points, but that was still coming off of like 70 shots per game, which in high school is pretty unheard of. Um, That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. We go from that to only averaging about 53 shots a game, which is still a fairly decent number, but we were making like 26, 27 shots. So we're almost shooting about 50%. Mm-hmm. But through that, we were we were getting out transition. We were playing defense a little bit more, but we were also taking very smart shots. So like it's more in efficient. Early, yeah, early in the year. So we got better. So at the end of the year, we were only averaging 9.8 turnovers a game, which in high school – is very uncommon because you you got you probably got more turnovers a lot of games than than you know most. But whenever I took the job, whenever we had very little talent six years ago, my motto was, "Hey, I would much rather you jack up every shot that you possibly get. Just don't turn the ball over because we cannot survive on a turnover." <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> just keep, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah, don't turn the ball over. We can't. We, we can't. We can't. Yeah. No, I get you. Yeah. Those are brutal. <laughs> So, so as we've gotten better, you know, my 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 thought process has kind of changed on that. Like, I'm like, no, don't turn the ball over, but we want good shots, along with not turn the ball over. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the DDM, because I didn't have a lot of strong. I mean, we were, we still kind of had the same thing, but because we didn't have such a strong core that could really ball handle a ton, you know, it wasn't that they were bad ball handlers, but you know, you got ball handlers that can go and make plays. The years before that, I had guys that could make plays, drive it to the basket, and it was a beautiful thing. So it, I took some of the extra dribbling out of it yeah, and kind of forced the ball into the kids that could play and ball handle and play make. And then the kids that couldn't, they were more so in my sprayers than my shooters. You know, and then I had a couple of crashers that go in and get 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 rebounds. So so everybody ended up having their own role a little bit more on this team going to five out than they previously had with DDM because you know not everybody can go downhill going left. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And and that that was going to be something I was going to follow up with, and I think that you know one of the things I imagine could be could be potentially difficult and I, I don't know if you face this or not is when you kind of have a position in the system where there's that freedom you could potentially run into situations where guys you know feel that they should be getting more shots they should be getting more looks or feel that you know that they're not getting the ball enough and and there, there's definitely a, a potential I think for team chemistry issues but but is that anything you ever had to experience or, or did guys learn how to like play within their strengths and and, and get get that together and figure it out pretty easily um, I like I didn't have many of that. I think I had one kid that I wanted to probably shoot a little bit more. Oh, that's not um, a bad problem to have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but he was fantastic on defense. And, yeah. and 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 when we play teams that play zone, I mean he would light it up most of his zone because he was he was just tall and lanky and very creative. And you know, we could just throw the ball at the rim and 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 he would just go get it, you know. And so 
we didn't have to worry about that. But uh, just from our stats from last year, we had um, one kid averaged 13.2 points per game, another kid that averaged 11.6, um, another kid they about they averaged eight apiece, and then I had a kid that averaged six, and then a kid that had four, and then I had a couple more that was like two, two, and two. They were in our rotation, but they got about you know, they, they got they got a decent amount of minutes per game. But I mean, we had you know four guys at one point that were averaging double figures. That was more so when we were going DDM, but their shooting percentage looked very faulty, you know. And so, you know, I I told one of my kids he was my best three point shooter. <laughs> I was like, um. I talked to him at the break because we were five and six. He was leading the team in scoring, but I was like, okay, you're averaging 14 or 15 points a game, but you're shooting the ball 22 or 23 times to get 15. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, how about you be a little bit more judicious and pick and choose where you're shooting? So later the second half of the season, he shot 48% from three wow. on about five or six attempts a game. That's that is efficient. <laughs> because because yeah. literally the corner shot and the and the and the and the wing shot, that we go over those shots the most in practice because that's where mostly if he caught that ball center cut right in his chest, it was money every single time. You know, or or and and then we found out where he was shooting the strongest from. And so the, like we I don't know how many of you coaches use huddle, but they have a lot of great stuff in there. Oh yeah, huddle's great. <laughs> And so I, I, I'm, I'm pulling up his shot chart right now. So I, um, I would probably say for the whole game, for the whole season, from the right wing, he shot 40% from three. The left wing, or I mean the, the right corner, he shot 40, 40% from three. The left corner, he shot 43%. The right wing, he shot 39%. And the left wing, he shot 38%. <laughs> and then the Man. top of the key, he was he was 67% for 21 shots. Like you said, he hit, that ball hits his chest, though, huh? That, it's that's it's it. a ball hit his chest. So what we worked on a lot within this, is we worked on everybody with their passing because we looked at a lot of his shots. And, like, if he was just a little bit off left, a little bit off right, it didn't go in. You know, and so we worked on everybody's jump shots. We we're like, I mean, uh, everybody's passing, you know, yeah, with yeah, yeah, position yeah. Lifting, everybody's got to be able to pass and everybody got to be able to play make. So we were like, well, if we got a couple of good shooters, which we had a couple that were that were pretty solid, we had a three that shot anywhere between, you know, that 46% uh, second half of the year, 48% the second half of the year. Total, total wise, that kid, he, he shot about 38, 39% for the, for the year. Um, but you know, you could probably tell from that 48%, he shot very bad his first semester. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, he, I think it was like 27% or something like that. Um, but we, we worked on passing and we worked on, you know, creating and keeping your head up and, 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 you know, putting some, some zip on those passes that way those op open shots continue to be open shots. And so even though it slowed down a little bit from us taking wild shots, we were still very efficient at what we were doing. If we would have gotten 70 shots up with the efficiency that we were doing, we would have been averaging about 70 points a game, you know? So, um, so I, I think from a position of spot, you know, those skills of passing, dribbling, receiving, you know, making quick decision, not over dribbling, not over doing it um, can go a long way. And 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 it sounds like you you told your guys about that, right? Like when this player when he catches the ball and this and we're right right in that pocket, like he's he's gonna he's gonna be money and things like that. It almost sounds like you kind of go over the the rationale and kind of some of the stats and some of the figures with them to help it make sense to him. Yeah, I mean, I have an assistant coach. He's really good at that, and so like I tasked him with last summer, and he's gonna do the same thing this summer. Is he's going through all of the, especially some of our top, uh, you know, players. He's going over you know, like in this position, he shot this, this, and this, and but he was really successful doing this and then try to tailor everything that we do to be able to get that kid in that exact spot or during the summer work on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if a kid can't catch out of the corner going to the left or he can't do something, then we try to acknowledge that and work on it and, and, and make it a, a not a, 
it, we won't be able to make it a strength in that short amount of time, but we can make it something where it's not a weakness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, especially when we're playing against teams that are way more talented than us, we got to be very, 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 very judicious in the way that we coach and the way that we develop. Um, because if I, I if I can bring out a team that's very skilled, we'll be able to compete and maybe beat kids that are not as skilled but skilled but athletic. You know, so I, I pride ourselves on being a very skilled, but also like using stats and analytics, which I've haven't always been that way. You know, being in college and working in the college level. You know, like the analytics part started taking over about 2015, 2014, 2015. Yeah, it got real big, yeah. And so spending that time doing that my last two years at OU um, really kind of brought that to me. And I was like, okay, I can analytic my way and scout my way into some probably some more victories that I'm probably not going to get any mm -hmm. if I don't do this, you know. And so um, so that's kind of what, what I went to. But my assistant coach is the one that brought – probably going positionless, five out, um, motion offense, um, to my attention, um, at the, at the break. And he put in a couple different actions and we put some skill to it and, and, and tailored it to what we do and our personnel. And it was really good for us. That's a, that, no, that, that that's great. And, uh, it's, I mean, I, I, like you mentioned before though, and I, I know, I know some of these coaches know this before, but man, huddle, I think is the best. There's so much you get out of that and, and so much you can teach your guys about things and, and help them learn the game through huddle. It's, I think that uh, every coach that would be using that or something real similar to it. Yeah. I mean, it's been great. I use it all the time and we actually went to huddle as a platform at the university of Oklahoma my last year. Um, and so that's, I brought it over. I was like, when I got the job, I was like, I need this and I need this now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. um, no, it's been really a help. And if, if any coach has it, I mean, use it. Like, I mean, I, I know some coaches, they, they use it, but I, I know a lot of coaches that really don't use it. And so I'm like, no, use it. It is a great resource for your kids. And it's a great resource if you're trying to tell your parents. Like, bruh, like you, 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 your, your son really ain't kicking it right now. Your daughter really ain't kicking it right now. Like he needs to work on these shots because this is what he's producing. And so if you're seeing that, like it's a great resource for parents to look at it and a great resource that helps back you up some of your decisions uh, that you make. Cause I, I've had a couple parents. I use the little, the, 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 um, the context where it kind of gives you what lineups are the best. Well, I had a starter that, you know, you know, that didn't finish the game sometimes because my better ending lineup was this lineup, <laughs> you know? So mm -hmm. it wasn't knocking on that kid. It was just like, hey, you've gotten 24, 25 minutes in this game. I, I need this lineup after the last four because it gives me the best dividends depending on the situation. You know, that, that kid was more of a defensive, you know, help for us. But, yeah. like, if we're, down, if we're down by two or three, yeah, we need the defensive help, but also we need to put the ball in the bucket. And so, like, I, I I don't go into any strategy not knowing. I got a little card that I write all of my things on. So when we get to the end of the game, like, all right, like, this is what we need right now for this situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes I kind of drive myself crazy in my coaching. <laughs> you know, so, like, you know, ain't all about that kind of stuff. But whatever important. edge I can possibly – Whatever edge I could give my kids for, you know, missing 20 some practices, I'm going to give it to them. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, how deep is your rotation? How, how deep do you, how deep did you go this past year? Um, on, on a, on a really good day, nine. Um, they they got to be ready when well, you don't know what rotation those guys are going to, who they're going to be mixed up with. So they got to be ready yeah. to work with anyone sort of thing. Yeah. Well, when we got down to the end of season seven, yeah, maybe it eight. tightens up a little bit, huh? Tightens up a little bit. Um, but I, I mean, if, if we, if, if they were locked in and ready to go, I can go nine and depending on matchups. Cause I, I sometimes play certain people depending on the matchup or, you know, if I need a three point shooter, I had a, I had a kid on my team, very good three point shooter, kind of on the little side, but I use him cause I know he's going to do everything. I use him as a spark. Sometime he's going to get a lot of minutes this year coming up. Uh, because he can literally shoot the ball. I mean, he's got a little bit stronger. So I think because of his size, I think him being a little bit stronger, a little bit wiser, a little bit older, I think he'll be able to uh, really contribute this next year. So, but a lot, that was his thing last year. Hey, let's go in the game, knock down a couple threes, 
boom, come back to the bench and we'll and we'll fire it up. So he'll 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 um he'll have an expanded role next year uh, for sure, and and I'm excited to kind of see his growth this summer. No, that, that, that's great. Um, you talked about a lot of work in transition. So you are you press heavy then? Are you trying to force a lot of turnovers, doing full court, half court press type action? Um, uh, depending on the game, depending on. Okay. The game. Um, I, I usually like to do. I'm, I'm strictly man to man, pretty much half court. Uh, um, after my own heart, saying that man to man. Oh that, yeah, I, I I I do run a little bit of the zone, but only at the change of pace. Um, I got a couple change of pace zones I like to run. Two three. I like the little one three one half court trap. Um, I'll run that depending on how much length I have. Like this year, I'll have a, a lot of length, so uh, we'll probably implement that. I didn't run it as much this last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did. I did a diamond like a one two two um, press this last year, and it okay. Um, I did a three quarter court. Actually, our strongest was three quarter court. We probably turned. Teams over probably 22 times when we ran it. Uh, because like I had I had a kid with a lot of length and a lot of size up top. He was about six three, long arms. And then I had a, a short quick guard on one side right behind him. And then I had another kid that was six four, uh lanky kid with about a six ten wingspan on the other side. So like when we got people in traps, it was like hell on wheels. Uh, yeah, and so, um, so, so we, we had a lot of, and then we had a couple of kids that were just really good defenders, um, back on the backside. So they would just always get steals or, or something. So we, we use it to our advantage, but it just kind of depends on the year of whether I'm a heavy press guy or, or not. So do you find ever in, in, a, in this position, the system, of, is, is there any, post action that that you that you really really get to a run or is that like kind of been pretty much much abandoned because it sounds like y'all don't don't have a lot of size um i got a couple guys that could probably post up this next year so there'll be some actions that we'll probably implement which last year we did a lot of we did a stagger punch action which we came off of a stagger um screens into a punch which is a is a post up which i, I know some people call it punch some just mm-hmm. call it you know, so we do. We did have actions like that, um, and we'll probably have those this this next year. I got a I got a kid that'll be a senior next year. That's you know he's getting some college uh, looks, and he wants to have a bigger expanded role. Um, so I mean, and he's probably going to be our own our main guy. That's probably going to get a lot of um, touches um, this next year. So. We'll put him in a lot of post ups and and things of that nature, especially because he'll be our main weapon. So I think whenever people start trying to double team him, because we'll have a couple of shooters on the outside, we'll put him in the post, and he'll be able to distribute from there too. Because he's about he'll be about six five, like he's six six. Right, maybe. So he's gonna have a little bit, a little bit down there that he can work with, a little bit. Of yeah, but he's naturally. Yeah, he's naturally a guard and he's yeah. a guard, but I'm trying to showcase him a little bit more for colleges for next year. Okay. Um, little more expanded uh, skill set. Yeah, an expanded skill set a little bit more. So we'll put him in some advantageous positions um, to be able to showcase that. I, I think he can literally be a 28 and six kid next year. Um, nice. Good on defense. So. I think he's got a lot of that in there, and and he's having a good AAU season so far. So, um, I, I think you know putting him in in good spots next year will be my task. So I've been looking at a lot of Villanova because they post up their guard very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, uh, Duke did a lot of posting up guards this last year. So just been looking at different ways that I can probably give him those advantages and. And he could be an assist guy from that spot or go score or yeah, kick it out a little bit or make a move or two sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, before we hit our concluding segment, uh, quick, quick, quick question. I, I was curious about if in case somebody was listening, who was in this situation. Maybe there's a coach out there who might be in a very structured system right now, but he's looking or she's looking to transition maybe into a more free flow into a little bit more positionless. Um, in general, what advice would you give to a coach who may be transitioning from a more structured, more rigid system and is looking to try and go into uh, maybe a more positionless style of basketball? Um, and I'm, I'm going to say this off top. Like, 
Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be one to, to, to tell a coach, you know, hey, whatever wins your games, go do it. <laughs> but I, I will say as a caveat to positionless, I think the freedom that you give, if you can kind of, you know, make a, you know, bends with them, like we can run this if we do this. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I think you would get a lot out of those kids, um, especially if you're a little bit less – I wouldn't say less talented, but like if if you're struggling with skill, I think like giving them the opportunity to expand their skill sets will actually help them in the long run. I'll probably charge this to teams that are young on the young side that you probably don't have much chance to maybe win next year, but you got a good foundation of young people and you're trying to build that skill and you got a bunch of freshmen and sophomores. Uh, I would definitely go to it now. And then I promise you, by the time they're, they're juniors and seniors, they stick with it. Like, I mean, they'll be, I mean, you'll be running teams out the gym. Um, because I think if you can empower them, then they'll be more so wanting to be in the gym and shoot more. You know, I, I got a, I got a shooting grid system that I implemented a couple of years ago. And, you know, I got it from uh, from another coach. I forgot where it came from, but I know it came from somebody. Uh, I think it uh, came from Arkansas, um, Neighbors. Oh, Neighbors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, we got green light shooting, red light yep, shooting. Yep, like, yep. like if you, if you're in the gym and you're tasked, Hey, like if you're a green light shooter, you can shoot anytime in the daggum game. Like, you know, you, you better you, be you shooting. Be, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, you, you'll be surprised at how that charges them up to do better and do more, you know? And so, um, especially like if you're in a small town or, and whatever, like, I mean, I'm opening up the gym all the time. Hey, get in the gym. Thousand shots a day. Let's go. Let's get it. So um, that that's kind of my 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 advice. If, if if you got a young team, you know sometimes if you're an older team, you're kind of been stuck in your ways. But if you're a young team and you're struggling now with winning, like don't even worry about winning games. Don't worry about developing them because I promise you the wins are going to come. Um, if you if you do it, um, you can you can slow the game down. You can speed the game up. It's just however you want to do it. But I, I would make it more positionless and create more skill players than than just you know just mundane pass to pass to pass you know so um but whatever you're doing if, if it's a if it's a winning formula do it but if you're you know if you're looking at doing something new i i, I would i would definitely go positionless and then teach them the skills and and develop them yeah especially if you're like you said you're a lower skill or maybe not really a as much of a successful program i think your players will like it and then kind of at the end of the day what do you have to lose right I'll yeah. go for it. See what happens. Yeah. I mean, because I, I, when I got here, we 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 came from a slow it down, pass the pass, but they averaged like 24 turnovers a game because eventually the more you pass, 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 unless mm -hmm. you're playing stall ball, which I know that's a, that's a big topic mm -hmm. in a lot yeah. of areas. But, like, if, I, if I'm an athletic team and I know you're about to pass, 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 I'm just going to jump the pass and go still in and go score, especially if they don't have a lot of talent. But if they, if you can teach them how to be effective in a lot of those positions, uh, then I think you know you'll 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 end up shooting a lot more. You'll end up, you know, scoring a lot more, and maybe even finding your way to 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 muck, muck up some games and maybe surprise a team or two. You know, while you're at it. Yeah. No. Definitely. Yeah. To wrap up, coach, there's a couple of questions I ask every guest, so I'll go ahead and start uh, with this first one here, which is. Thinking back on your coaching career, what is a moment from your coaching career that you think others listening would be able to learn from? Um, I, I will say that just kind of really quickly, I, I had a really good year a couple of years ago. We, we, we went 18 and 8. No, 18 and 10. Uh, we went to the semifinals of state. Uh, lost to a really good team. Um, uh, we played really well, but they were just really they were just better. They had like three D1T kids on their team. And we just lost, you know, we battled really well. But the next year coming back, we we brought back three starters and, you know, no, we brought back two starters and, you know, a couple of good role players cut off the bench that were going to be starters. And, and I will say this, like, I coached them as if I was still coaching the team before. And, mm -hmm. and I held them to that standard instead of creating a standard for that team. Each team is going to be different. Each year is going to be different. I would I would say separate those teams. Separate. I mean, the expectation is always going to be play your school's brand of basketball, but each team 
is going to take a different journey to get to where you want them to go. So you got to find that, lean into it, hold them to uh, hold them to that standard and, and let them grow. Um, Cause I think that, that was a huge mistake of mine. And I think cost us probably five or six games that year uh, that we could have won because I was being a butthole and, you know, and, and, and berating them because I wanted them to be as good as the year before when to real, realistically we were not. So each uh, team's different, huh? Each yeah. team is different, you know? And so the battle that we took from the year before wasn't the same battle that, 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 that they would, that should have taken the year after. So. Mm -hmm. I yeah. uh, appreciate I appreciate you sharing that. Sometimes those those are tough lessons, but if you learn them, luckily you hopefully don't make that same mistake again. And it sounds like that was something that that you uh, learned a lot from. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's a good lesson, you know. And so that's why I think this year was probably my best coaching spot because the year last year uh, we were probably better talent wise and kind of underperformed a little bit. This year we they bought into what we were doing. Uh, won 16 games, played a really tough schedule. I mean, our, I think our, our overall schedule, I think it was like wins and loss record of our opponents was 113 and 63. Oh, wow. So, I mean, we, we were tested night in and night out. It may have even been worse than that. I, I don't know more than that, but I know no every, days off. <laughs> yeah, we, we had no days off and they, they, they took it head on and they get, and we got better and better and better. So, um, so I, I feel like even if we didn't make it as far as maybe that team did when we went 18 and 10, uh, I believe that um, we – that was my best coaching job because I took what should have been not a very good year and turned it into a really solid year. So mm -hmm. yeah, Awesome. Coach, to wrap up, I give every guest what I call 60-second soapbox. It's your platform kind of to get out a final message, a closing thought, a final idea that, that you want to leave uh, the listeners with and – you feel free to take that in any direction that you want to. So I'm just going to kind of open up the floor, Coach, and uh, I'm just going to kind of let you take it from here. Um, I, I would charge um, all all high school coaches uh, to support your 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 kids and, and their AAU coaches. Um, I think, you know, the game of basketball is, is a small world and it's a great sport. And, and you know, I've, I've coached both AAU and high school. And, and there's nothing more than we need to be as, as caveats for the people that are helping our kids uh, get to the next level. I know there's a lot of infighting and a lot of ups and downs with, you know, but if, if we all get on, it's all for the kids, you know. And so if those kids, uh, if we get those kids to the next level, whether, you know, it's business or basketball, uh, we all need to be working together. So I, I would really charge uh uh, high school coach and AAU coach, get on the same page and 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 do it all for the kids. Love it. That's really well put, Coach. I want to thank you for coming on here, talking about uh, your program, talking some positionless basketball with us, and and just the kind of the culture and and, and the way that you uh, get the most out of, out of the program that you're in, even though there are some uh, limitations that might exist. So sounds like you all had a great year last year, and and things are are just going to keep hopefully going in the right direction next year. So. Best of luck, not only with uh, coaching, but athletic director and probably all the, the 10, 15 other hats that you put on as well. Coach Bryson, really appreciate you coming on talking to us. Uh, thank you for having me and good luck to all you coaches that you guys um, listen and, and, and fee fill, your, fill your cups for the, for the summer and, and the year to come. Love it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for listening. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast, and we will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.